Oh, week nine of quarantine. Nine. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Everyone's a little bit unsatisfied. Everyone's been stuck at home, losing their minds. Let us out to look around. Go outside, not now, not now. Netflix binge, Hulu too, saw Sondheim's birthday. Read all the books I own, I'm learning to crochet. I need something to do this 14th of May. What now? What now? I figured it out. What I can do. No need to pout. It's for you too. The Phoenix Giveathon is all fun and laughs. This is a fundraiser, so get out your cash. We so appreciate your support in cash or card or checks or stocks or money. Sit back, relax. We've got some great past stacks. You still have time to get some snacks. Welcome to tonight's Phoenix give a thought. Hi, I'm Bill Simmons, Artistic Director of the Phoenix Theater Cultural Center, and I am delighted to welcome you back into our home. First off, let me apologize for the slow start tonight. Uh, during the time of COVID-19, I like to tell people Bill Simmons is to technology what Jane Fonda is to the Xerox machine at nine to five. So while I can't take responsibility for the technical difficulties tonight, I have them constantly when I'm doing Zoom calls with board members and, and major donors. So I've been told to talk even louder, so here we go. Um, the purpose of tonight's uh, event is to raise money for the Phoenix Theater Cultural Center. This is our first ever give-a-thon. Obviously, we're in and in, 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 extraordinary time in our world, uh, certainly is the case for us here at the Phoenix Theater. So your gift tonight will help us weather this extraordinary storm and emerge out the other side even stronger than, and better than we ever were before. So by making a gift, either by calling, we have staff members safely positioned around the building, you can go online, you can text, or you can use old-fashioned snail mail. Any way you would like to get us a gift would be much appreciated. We have set ourselves a goal tonight of $25,000 in the next four hours. Uh, we have every reason to believe we're going to make that. And if we don't come close, I, I believe we will. It certainly won't be because of a lack of generosity from you people, because we've experienced some extraordinary generosity in the last two months since we've been closed. So thank you very much. You've already made a gift. And if you're considering a gift, I hope tonight's uh, entertainment and checking in with board members and donors and some of our beloved artists will convince you that now is the time to make a gift. So the way we're going to be doing this is every hour we have donors who have already agreed to make gifts to match up to certain amounts. So in this first hour, former board chair and current board member Greg Keterman and his wife Judy have made a $500 gift. And because Greg works for Eli Lilly and Company, that has matched with another $500. And Nick and Callie Zabranco also have gifted us $500. So in this first hour, we have $1,500 in money committed to match every gift that comes in up to $1,500. So what will your gift do? It will allow this 37-year-old Indianapolis institution that changes the mind, touches the heart, and inspires the human spirit to continue through this extraordinary time and merge out the other side. Now, I would like to introduce one of my favorite board members, Dr. Daniel H. Spitzberg, MD. So I just want to say something about Dan Spitzberg. Uh, it's been a joy to have him join our board of directors. He joined it last summer. And since that time, he has committed not only financially to the institution, but he's been bringing other major donors to the institution. Uh, and he's been speaking, I know, quite well about the work that we're doing. I was delighted that he brought donors to our production of Vino Veritas last October. And tonight, throughout the evening, if you make a gift for $100 or more, we will be sending you these lovely masks 
made by Daniel Buckle, our props and costume uh, supervisor, manager of the uh, costume and props department. Uh, she has made over 100 of these masks and for a gift of $100 or more, we'll send you one. This happens to be part of the fabric used to make the Queen Elizabeth costume in Vino Veritas. So you can have this over your very own face for the next, for the foreseeable future. Uh, again, gifts of $100 or more. Also, pieces such as this from the Hotel Nepenthe, uh, part of Betsy Norton's costume. So for gifts of $100 or more, you can get your very own mask. Now, I think we're going to hear from Dan and Suzanne. I'm Suzanne McAllister. With our stay-at-home orders in place, the Phoenix Theater is on a long intermission. But with your support, the Phoenix Theater will be back stronger than ever. Thank you. Hi, Bill Simmons. I can't hear you. I cannot. I can, I can see you moving your mouth, <laughs> but I can't hear you. So I have no idea what you're saying. So let me just talk. How's that? I have worked at the Phoenix for a while and I've done some really, um, I've had the opportunity to be involved in some really amazing um, productions at the Phoenix and I consider it my home and I hope that you will consider giving as much as you can at this time. Um, I'm going to bring out an old character. Uh, <laughs> four years ago, at this very moment in time, I was on stage playing a woman who um, intimated that she might be Ethel Merman. I don't know if she was or not. If you were in the audience, I hope you had as good a time as I think everybody was having. That show sold so, so well. And I think that's why they've asked me to kind of bring her back. I'm going to do a sassy little number that comes from the very beginning. It's the very first thing you see her do. Um, and Jay Schwant, nope, not going to play the piano because he doesn't live here with me. But hopefully you'll be able to hear him out of this little speaker back here. Let's see what we can't do, huh? Bear with me, folks. Hold on, technical difficulties. Which means I just dropped my phone. It's no worries. Here we go, ready? Most people sit on their ass, scratching nuts or passing gas. Well, that's okay for those people who can't walk while they chew. Most people stay in the cold, smelly, wet, and full of mold. Well, that's perfect for those people if that's all they can do. But you got textbooks to view. When I think of all those subjects you gotta study, all those things that you gotta learn, final exams that you gotta cram for, midnight oil is gonna burn. Most people, the best they do is get through life adding two plus two, but that's okay for those people whose heads up their all zoo. But most people in you. Now I'm backstage for a very quick costume change. Most people ain't worth a dime. Take up space and waste your time. Well, that's okay for those people, the crazy, lazy, dumb people you see. But that's not you or you or me. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Now, give, 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 give. And I couldn't have done it, of course, without my crew here at the house. So, thanks. Thank you very much, Jolene Mentink Moffitt. Uh, delightful as always. I can actually hear you singing. I'm thoroughly bummed that we couldn't actually have a conversation. But you and I talk about every three or four days. So I guess we do have conversations all the time, mm -hmm. talking about the work and checking in with each other. Oh yeah. my God, I hope you're doing well. And I love am. those kids. Very safe staying hopeful and i can't wait to create art at the phoenix theater again soon i love you my friend i love you too bye everybody 
So that was our good friend Jolene Menti Moffat, and when we are able to get back to producing art, we hope that our next production will be Audrey Seppley's Alabaster. Jolene was all set to direct that. In fact, we should be heading into the second weekend of that production right now. We have tabled that for uh, just as soon as we can reopen. So you will be seeing Jolene's work as a director again very soon. So this hour, we are delighted to have Hotel Tango with us. We have a fantastic gift basket full of swag from them to give away to the lucky winner of this hour's donor drawing. Your donation of $150 or more will enter your name into a drawing for the gift basket. At the end of the hour, we'll announce the lucky winner live. So get your donations in before 5 p.m. for your chance to win. And for more, uh, please help me welcome Thomas Hartman from Hotel Tango. Hi, everyone. How are we doing? Good, Thomas. Can you hear me? I hear you very well this time around. Awesome! We've got a win! Yeah, we're um, go ahead. Uh, we're good to go. Oh, that's awesome. So tell us a little bit about uh, Hotel Tango's history here in Indianapolis. Yeah, definitely. So um, we uh, opened in September 15th of 2014. We are uh, slowly approaching six years coming up. We are the first combat disabled veteran owned and operated distillery in the nation and the first distillery to open in Indianapolis since Prohibition. So a little brief history on us. So yeah. I'll keep it going because we don't have a video. Well, awesome. And so tell us about some of your products. Yeah, so we have a wide array of uh, products in our spirit portfolio. We start with vodka, we have gin, and then we move all the way down to uh, bourbon. So and a little bit of everything in between limoncello, cherry liqueurs, um, a little bit of everything for everybody. And I have to say, you have some of the best packaging I've ever seen. You did a uh, tasting for some of the staff here at the Phoenix Theater, and I was completely taken by the uh, design of your packaging. So kudos to you guys on that. Uh, how can people support you guys during the quarantine closure? Well, right now, our Fletcher Place tasting room is open um, seven days a week still currently. We are doing uh, carry-out bottle service. Um, we are doing uh, an array of cocktail kits, and we also have hand sanitizer for sale as well. Um, for those of you who uh, can't seem to find it, like the majority of us, um, and we're open from four to eight, seven days a week. That's really great. So people can come in and like sort of get a like a to-go bar that they can take home, and you guys kind of put that whole thing together. Well, they can't really come in just yet, but <laughs> soon. <hopefully. laughs> That's great. That is great. So what's next for Hotel Tango? Uh, we're currently, we're just in the process of getting ready for reopen soon, whenever we're available and just kind of dealing with life with COVID, not after COVID. Um, so I think that's, a, a journey for a lot of Americans coming up soon. Um, so we're just getting ready to, uh, put a battle plan into action and really go back to being part of our community again and giving back. So. Well, that's actually wonderful. That's a wonderful way to think about what we're all going through is being ready to kind of move forward. Um, so, uh, again, just to remind everybody, for gifts of $150 or more, online donations by phone or by text, that gets your name into this drawing. We will be putting your names into a randomizer, and winners, uh, recipients of those prizes will be announced throughout the evening. So thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, be well. We can't wait to uh, get back to Hotel Tango just as soon as you guys can reopen. We can't wait to see you guys. Be well, Thomas. So uh, just to remind you, we have uh, matching donors for this hour. So let's hear from one of them next. Uh, please help me welcome Nick and Callie Zaborenko, who live up in Zionsville. Are you guys with us? Nick and Callie, are you there? Um, I hear somebody. Okay, uh, can you hear us now? Yeah, I can hear you both. How are you? Doing well, how are you guys? I am doing very, very well. Uh, we are all, not all, just a few of us are here in the building and we're social distancing, but we're doing okay. How about you two and your son? Uh, we're doing okay. We're both working from home, and obviously David's home with us, and we're lucky enough. My parents have been staying with us this entire time, so we have at least quite a few more adults than kids in the house, so the odds are good. Yeah. 
Yeah, and is he requiring homeschooling? Is your son that old yet that you've got you've had yeah, a program homeschooling? Yeah, with him through uh, Zionsville schools. Yep. Okay. In kindergarten, so the e-learning doesn't take that much time, but it's still enough to occupy us. Our oh, calendar. Well, really. I'm glad to hear you're all doing well, and that uh, your son has grandparents there with him. That must be a lovely thing for him. It so, is. Uh, tell me a little bit about why you two kind of gravitated to the Phoenix Theater and, and why you are supporters of our work. Well, uh, we've been going to the uh, Phoenix uh, for about eight years now, since uh, our first show uh, was uh, Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson back in 2012. Oh. And we've just been captivated by the Phoenix, uh, the fact that you have um, plays that have never been seen in India before, uh, plays that are relevant currently, that are engaging, uh, that bring in a diverse audience, diverse uh, cast and crew. That's all been a big part of uh, why we support the Phoenix. Well, that is wonderful to hear. Uh, uh, aside from Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson, what are some of your uh, favorite memories or, or experiences at the Phoenix Theater? Hotel Nepenthe was was great, and so was the Acid Dolphin experiment. Oh yeah, that was fun, and uh, Typhoid Mary. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, Tom Horan's works have been uh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, the Phoenix Xmas uh, is uh, often the highlight. Uh, when uh, Rob climbed those silks, that was great. Yeah, yeah. Rob's aerial act, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, some of the uh, collective works as well, uh, such as uh, uh, the. Um, uh, what was it called? Uh, the uh, Edgar Allan Poe based Cabaret Poe. Oh, Cabaret Poe. Yeah, that was a big highlight too. Mm -hmm. Well, I am delighted that you like some of the uh, more, um, I guess, adventurous or esoteric work. <laughs> um, yeah, I certainly have loved collaborating with Tom Haran, and I actually got to direct Acid Dolphin Experiment and Typhoid Mary is, is the pill. And those have been some of my most rewarding experiences. Um, and actually, I, I think my kids uh, haven't seen every holiday show, but they saw the one where Rob did the silks, and that remains one of their favorite uh, experiences of the holidays as well. So tell us a little bit why you think uh, other donors should step forward during this important time. Well, honestly, uh, you know, there's uh, essential work and there's uh, essential work, right? And we think that arts and culture are essential. They are part of the heart of uh, any city, any culture. So supporting uh, places like the Phoenix that not just to have their own uh, art, uh, uh, but they also bring in a uh, wide uh, group of artists around the city uh, and support their development, I think is crucial for at this time and at any other time, in fact. Thank you both so much. That was a beautiful sentiment, Nick. Um, Nick and Callie, please be well during this very difficult time, and I cannot wait to see you back in the Phoenix Theater Cultural Center sometime soon. So be well and give that sunny ears a squeeze. You as well. We'll do. Take care. Thanks. Bye, guys. Um, so in addition to our Hotel Tango gift basket, we have a second giveaway available this hour. The Republic National Distributing Company is offering a gift basket of four bottles of Imagery, imagery of state wines and a virtual wine tasting with wine specialist Jennifer Pepinger. So donate $150 now for your chance to win that package. Um, so don't forget that you can call us. Again, we have uh, Phoenix Theater staff members positioned in safe locations throughout the building. You can always go online, you can text, or you can use old fashioned snail mail. Now, I would like to check in with a longtime friend of mine, uh, actor extraordinaire, Scott Greenwell. So Scott, are you there? I am, Bill, how are you? I'm good, my friend, how are you? I'm doing all right. I was, um, I just saw that Hotel Tango thing and I was like, oh Lord, I don't drink anymore, but oh, if I did, if I did, I would like to be there. Anyway, mm -hmm. how you, yeah. uh, how it, I love I love your background there. Oh, thank you very much. This is the uh, uh, Steve Russell Memorial Mural. His uh, widow, Livia Russell, uh, made it possible for us to have this extraordinary mural behind us. And yes, it's actually, I've only been back in the building maybe three or four times since we had to close down for COVID-19. Um, and it is, it's, it's, I mean, I know it's a cliche, it's sort of bittersweet 
to be back in this building but not have any artists here and not creating work. Uh, so it's so it's such a treat to be able to talk to artists such as you. Well, we will um, we'll be back there soon enough. I don't know when, but you know. It's okay. We'll make it. Hey, I have a game for us to play. What do you think? Oh, about that? yeah. Okay. Okay. Now I um, have. I first did a show at the Phoenix Theater in 2005, so I've been working there 15 years or so, and I will do a few characters or give you at least uh, a description of my character within character to help you guess. What show, at least, and if you can guess the character, I will be really impressed. But see if you can guess what show it is that I am doing a character from. What do you think? All right, I'm Dave. Okay. Now, I will give you a couple of hints. I've only okay. done one play, one production there at the New Cultural Center, so it's not going to be that one. All okay. of these are going to be from the other space that was on Park Avenue. And also, I won't do anything from a Phoenix Xmas show. It's all going to be a production that is not Phoenix Xmas, okay? Okay. All Sounds right. great. Now, I don't know if I'm a lot, if I'm supposed to do these. I'm not sure. I, I've actually told your producer that I'm going to be doing this, but I didn't know if they were going to tell me what characters. So I'll just start doing characters, okay? I okay. Guess. All okay. right. Mm. All right, um, this one, I have to change my voice a little bit, and he's, he kind of, I have to put my voice back up in uh, the top of my mouth here. I am a celebrated author, if I do say so myself, and I did have a very strange meeting with a very well-renowned uh, psychiatrist of his time. I did write The Chronicles of Narnia, so hopefully that will give it away if it hasn't given away already. Do I need to buzz in? Because I think I had it after you said about four words. But would you like me to oh, wait and see if actually? Wonderful. You can buzz in with your hand if you want to. Okay. Shut up. All right. I'm going to guess it's C.S. Lewis. Very good. It is C.S. Lewis. If I got to that Chronicles of Narnia thing and you hadn't said anything, I was going to be very worried. No, I love that script. It was the Sigmund Freud part of it that uh, I, I, I had nailed it already before that. But Sigmund Freud uh, uh, nailed it for me. But. We don't know that they actually met, but I love that play because it says, what if they did meet and discuss God or the absence of God? Okay, here's another one. All right. Let's see. You are humble audience. You have come to see what it's like when people can't pee free. Rich folk get the good life, poor folk get the woe. In the end, it's nothing you don't know. This uh, is, you know it? Uh, yeah, it's your in town. But I, I keep getting them sooner, but I just like to hear you act and sing. It's been kind of delightful. <laughs> we can make the whole night just this, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> That's the opening number from your in town. That was my first show uh, at the Phoenix in the fall of 2005. Oh, wow. That's been 15 years? Yeah. How about oh, that? Scott. Oh. No. Yeah. We're getting older, my friend. All right. I know. All right. <laughs> Why, hello. I'm looking for Kevin. No, I can't come in right now. I might get water all over your floor. Yes. I'm soaking wet. Yes, I'm from somewhere you've never been. Buzz. Is yes. it, uh, is it uh, Steve Yaki's octopus? Yes, Steve Yaki's octopus. I wonder if people remember that because I definitely loved it. We got to flood the stage. Yes, and I heard a story that uh, the, during tech, uh, it had not been tested yet. And when the water rushed out, it shorted all the, the lighting instruments that were on the floor. <laughs> That, that might have happened. There was a moment where um, the doorway, you, the set was an apartment, and when at one point the door to the apartment was supposed to slam open and water rushes in. And so the technical crew had a really awesome solution for that, filling that area up with water. But then, of course, it all started to bow and, and whatnot. By the end of the production, water was leaking through when it was not supposed to be leaking through. Good times. I Good find time. that absolutely shocking. All right, I think we got time for at least one more. Oh, okay, okay. Um, let's see, here's one. Populism, yeah, yeah. 
Populism, yeah, yeah. Populism, yeah, yeah. Buzz. Okay. Is that Bloody Blood? Were you in Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson? Yeah, I was in Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson. I'm so sorry. I just remember Claire in the wheelchair and Eric Olson as Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson. And maybe it was Ariane in that show? Ariane was in that show too. Claire in the wheelchair. I, I mean, I I can't I can't even think about it because I'll crack up. Her just moving across that stage in a motorized wheelchair. Yeah, and every um, time she did it, she would still focus. It was awesome. I'll do one last one. Okay, great. Lap 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 lap. Here, I'm I'm in character. And I'm I'm a little bit of a oh yeah, you probably can't see me, but I'm driving a car. And I'm a little bit of a bumpkin if you ask me. But man, I love Indiana. I oh, guess, the it, Zippers of Zimmerville by my friend Jack O'Hara. That's right. Yeah. The secret, the secret to a fast moving car in the Zippers of Zimmerville was fat baby hot pee. I don't know if you remember that, but as long as you could get a fat baby to pee in your gas tank, you were going to get around that racetrack faster in nobody's business. Oh, yes. I do remember that. I think I saw both iterations. I had well, Scott, it has been a delight to talk to you, my friend. And someday you and I are going to do I love for I look forward. I look forward to that. Hey, it's good to see you. God Please be knows. well. And everybody else out there, too. Please yeah. be well. All right. And my best is Zach as well. So be, be well. All right. So now i want to talk a little bit about our extraordinary board of directors i have been an arts administrator in this city since god was a boy or maybe just during the early clinton administration and i can honestly say this is one of the strongest boards with which i have worked uh, they're extraordinarily dedicated they have taken us through some very difficult times and they are still going to take us through this very difficult time they're um, uh, uh, amazingly loyal uh, they're extraordinarily generous and they are determined to see us through this. So without uh, further ado, um, I would like to introduce you to our wonderful board chair, the steward of this wonderful organization, Matt Burton, who has a few wonderful things to say to you all. Thanks, Bill. My name is Matt Burton. I have the high honor and distinct privilege of being chair of the Phoenix Theater Board of Directors. For over 35 years, the Phoenix Theater has served to fill a critical void in the Indianapolis arts landscape through its production of professional, independent, cutting-edge performances. We were blessed to open a new building less than two years ago and have been able to expand our scope and mission to serve as an arts and cultural center, which has served as a home to numerous partner performances by the likes of the Summit Performance, Gregory Hancock Dance Company, and many others. As our world battles with and grasps the impact of the COVID-19 epidemic, the arts community has been forced into hibernation. While we are all itching to see the enterprises turn their lights back on and do what they do best, the health and safety of our performers, patrons, and employees reign supreme. So we find ourselves in the midst of a catch-22. Do we power up and perform and run the risk of spreading the virus, or do we remain shuttered to protect those we love? For us at the Phoenix, there's simply no choice other than to open the Phoenix only when we are confident that our actors, ticket holders, and employees are safe to perform, watch, and work. As we look to navigate this labyrinth, we are appealing to our longtime fans and newcomers and asking for your support to keep the Phoenix alive so when, not if, we are able to open back up to the public that we have the ability to do so. I wanna thank the mayor of Indianapolis, Joe Hogsett, for his leadership during this time, as well as the guidance of Julie Goodman and the entire Arts Council of Indianapolis. My gratitude to all my fellow board members, as well as the staff of the Phoenix Theater. They are the employees that are a lifeblood of our operation. We're grateful to each and every one of them. My friend, mentor, and fellow board member, Frank Basile, once told me that, Matt, a crisis is simply an opportunity to find a solution to a problem. With your help today, you can be part of that solution which is to keep the lights on so when it's time to raise the curtain, the Phoenix will go back to doing what it does best, providing Central Indiana with creative and unique theater at an affordable price point. Thank you in advance for your pledge of support today. I'll turn it back over to our Artistic Director, Bill Simmons, and Kathy Patalik, Director of Advancement.
So long, everyone. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for helping us through this extraordinary time. Now, I would like to again hear from Dr. Dan, Dr. Daniel H. Spitzberg, MD, an event sponsor. We're going to hear more from him right now. Um, so I thought we would just start with uh, getting to know you a little bit and uh, tell me about uh, when you started getting involved in the arts. Was it as a child or as a teenager or as in college? When were you uh, drawn to being a supporter of the arts or participating in them? Well, I grew up in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, and uh, uh, both my parents were uh, played piano and were actually very uh, accomplished at it. And um, the um, uh, frequently Thanksgiving time, holiday times, Christmas times, uh, following a dinner, uh, we had um, an uncle of mine played banjo and um, my parents played the piano. And uh, that was kind of our entertainment after the uh, dinner. So I was introduced to that uh, very early. And I, um, <clears throat> played piano myself, and then ultimately in school, uh, don't ask me why, took up the trombone. And I did that for about two years. Uh, and then I decided to get a set of drums and I played the uh, drums. And I have to say, uh, I was not very good with all three of them. Uh, and um, of course you had your high school play and my direction was somewhere in a profession, whether that be engineering, uh, pharmacy, medicine. Uh, but I decided to go out for the play. And uh, lo and behold, I got the part as the priest in the play. So go figure. <laughs> what play was it? Well, it was a play that was... Uh, it was really, uh, I, I'm spacing the name of it now, so, uh, but it was a play that was not an overly religious play or social play, it was, but there was a priest in the play and they wanted me to play that part. So I was hoping you were going to say you played Friar Lawrence in a production of Robbie. Well, it, I, I was actually thinking of that and I, and I, was, I was not remembering exactly the name of it. No, that's that's great. So uh, you grew up in Fort Wayne. Did you go to one of the public high schools, or did you go yes. to a private? I went to a public high school, Northside uh, High School, uh, and then um, following high school, went to Indiana University uh, in a uh, pre medical program, and finished that in three years, and then went to medical school in Indianapolis at the Indiana University Medical School. Good evening, folks. My name is Chelsea Anderson. I'm the Artistic Manager at Phoenix Theater. We are so happy you've joined us for this wonderful fundraiser. I'm excited to let you know our donation total so far this hour. We've only been at this for about 40 minutes, and we've already raised $1,740. And that's entirely thanks to all of you. So thank you so very much for letting us be a part of your evening in this wonderful rainstorm that we have going on. Uh, we have some great acts and some great folks who are coming up here very shortly. I'd like to introduce the costume and properties manager. Her name is Danielle Buckle. She's making this fantastic mask for us. And I think we've got some video there. There she is working. She's really making them by hand, folks. I promise it's for real. <laughs> so. If you want to get one of those masks, do give us an invitation. I'm sorry, not an invitation, a donation of $100 or more. And we're happy to send one of those off to you along with a Phoenix bookmark. All righty. Thank you so much, Danielle, for making those for us. And I think it's about time that we can pull up our host with the most, Mr. Bill Simmons. I think we'll be coming back with us shortly here. Prior to that, we have one Jordan Munson, and Jordan is a wonderful musician and composer. You may have heard of his work around town or nationally. He's kind of a big deal. And uh, we'll bring in Jordan here for an interview. We have had the pleasure of working with Jordan on a show in the past. There he is there. Hi, Jordan. And we have a show coming up with him uh, up in our next season. Now, Jordan 
We've got a, a wonderful conversation we'd like to have with you, and I think Bill will be joining us for that conversation, but I'm hoping you can get us started by telling us a little bit about your musical career and what you've got going on. Thanks, Chelsea. Good to see you, uh, and congratulations on, you know, uh, all the fundraising we've done so far. Um, oh, hey, there's Bill. <laughs> Hi, Bill. Jordan, how are you? Good. How are you? Uh, I'm just... We were... I'm good. We're having some Wi-Fi issues here in the building. I don't know if it's the storm or, or uh, what. Oh, yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, so, great. how are you? I'm pretty good. Pretty good. How about you? It, it's, it seems like the fundraiser is going really well. I think so. So far, so good. I mean, you know, technology, and as I said before, me and technology have never been very good friends. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not controlling any of it. I'm just at its mercy. So. Right. Um, so I'd like to actually talk to you about um, uh, the Hotel Nepenthe. Um, that yep. was the first project that you did with us. And like, what was your experience on that work with Brian Hartz on what I call the soundscape for that show? Yeah, it was wonderful. Uh, Brian Hartz, uh, who was the sound designer for that show, brought me in because he had heard some uh, of my music. Uh, it was such an amazing uh, production. And I really enjoyed working on it because there's a uh, you know, lots of layers to it, obviously, but like a schizophrenic quality to it <laughs> that I really find appealing in uh, in creating art. So, give me the opportunity to like try on a lot of different uh, musical hats, do a lot of different styles. And one thing we did in that project was like have a really strong theme for one of the characters and sort of vary that many different ways, which is a lot like how the the play goes down. You know four actors, but uh, I don't know how many parts there are, are right? 16 or something like that. Um, so uh, it was really a really good experience to work on that. Uh, I enjoyed that quite a bit. Yeah, I had a, I think from top to bottom on that production, I had the best time working with the artists, the designers, um, and the four actors when I directed that project. And what I loved is I would just send like ideas of songs to you and Brian, and then you would create your own original composition sort of based on inspiration and then what i really love too is you guys came to a lot of run-throughs and got a good mm -hmm. sense of how that show where it was going to live and how it was going to feel and it remains among my top three directing projects oh. i just loved it yeah i i think you know it, it, it's so successful too because of all the the passion people brought to that project you know uh, on stage but also all the designers and um, I, I really, it, it's 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 a really highlight of my career too. So, I'm glad you think so. So I know you're on deck uh, when we finally do get to produce KT Peterson's Lovebird. How does yeah. Lovebird? If you want to tell uh, other the people on Facebook and maybe a little bit about what Lovebird is about and, and how you're thinking about attacking that project. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't. Oof, what what is Lovebird about? You know, there, uh, <laughs> there, are, there are two birds on an island and they, you know, one, one of them's falling in love with an inanimate object and the other one's falling in love with that, that bird. So I don't know, but, uh, I, you know, it's about, I think it's about connection, you know, uh, just like the, the need for connection. There's, it's, it's another one of these like Hotel Nepente, there's comedy, but certainly there's a lot of uh kind of sadness and romance and other things wrapped up in there too so for me musically there's a bit of um kitschy polynesia in there you know there's a lot of kitsch just in the stuff that they they might have built their house out of in that island and you know it's it's, it's just like a uh, very rich imagery there and so i wanted to do some things with you know like ukulele and theremins and then some other things with um that that might be a little more uh you know romantic like gone with the wind sort of orchestral things and just kind of a range of, of stuff that might happen so i uh, i was told you have some samples that you want to share during I've, the segment yeah i've i have a little sample of that i mean nothing you know we haven't gotten too far into production yet so yeah. uh there's, there's not a whole lot to do, but, you know, the idea that just like in any uh, 
film or play or, 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 or uh, when you're setting music to visual medium, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, characters that you can create themes for and sort of those, those can live as their musical identity. So just working on a little theme. Let's see if I can, if you can hear this. All right. One second. So can you hear this? Yeah. <laughs> little ukulele and just very early phases, kitschy, and then we get some little theremin. <laughs> There. Yeah, so these little, you know, kind of sweet and sad uh, sounds that might come out. <laughs> so we'll see. We'll see what happens with that. And, and there's there's a lot more room to to develop and have some of the actors play play some sounds on stage and it's gonna be a lot of fun yeah. I, I just I'm mesmerized by your work I, I I'm probably gonna mangle the name of it do you call it COVID somnia is that your long musical I, th thing I think so you can, yeah. yeah yeah I've been doing these uh you know uh, uh 10 hour 12 hour all night uh audio visual things on YouTube um, mm -hmm. I'm gonna do another one this weekend so I think in total it'll be 40 hours at this point and they kind of generate their own audio visual things and but i sort of built these environments i find them mesmerizing i believe it or not i just finished Dor doris kern's goodwin's book team of rivals about lincoln and one morning on a weekend i was the first one up with the dogs and her cat and i had COVID insomnia play i was reading about lincoln's cabinet and the dogs were circling around me and i'm like just the era of COVID nineteen, just the weirdest, weirdest <laughs> yeah. crap starting to happen. Um, it's interesting what it's what it's done for creativity. I think mm -hmm. you know, for some people, it, it you know, I don't know, it break it's it's broken up on some time or uh, allowed us to think on di different uh, areas of our our creativity that we might not have the time for. Usually, yeah. you know, and I'm not doing the arts administration part of this place. Um, I've been thinking about a lot about love burn and I'm just really thinking how important it is uh, for us to, to do a play like that, which is about connection. Because I think when we get back to the work, Alabaster, which is a play about women healing from mm -hmm. trauma. Mm -hmm. And then there's a goat character who dies and then love burn about, you know, connecting and, and finding those places where you connect. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm so looking forward. I think we're all going to be so hungry for that kind of work when we can get back to it. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, it's, it's, there's, there'll be some catharsis wrapped up in that too, I think. You know. Well, be well, my friend, and I look forward to when we get to uh, create again. Yes, me too. Thanks, Bill. All right, be well. Now, uh, because we've been having some technical glitches, we are going to jump back in the script and we're going to check in with another one of my favorite board members. Actually, they're all marvelous in their ways, but I, uh, I'm also particularly fond of Mary Beth Walker Bailey. Um, are you there, Mary Beth? I can't hear you. I'll just say wonderful things about you. So for the last three galas of the Phoenix Theater Cultural Center, Mary Beth has been the chair um, and we had some remarkable nets, net proceeds from those events. And also, uh, Mary Beth shared her wonderful singing talents uh, in the choir of Martha Jacobs' production of The Christians, which was on the Livia and Steve Russell, was in the theater, this Livia and Steve Russell Theater about 14 months ago, and Pam Blevins Hinkle of Spirit and Place was the choir director. And again, that was just such a wonderful collaboration. So Mary Beth, are you there? I am. I'm here. I want to know how uh, Dr. Spitzberg became the favorite board member. I think not <laughs> on yet. No, I just said you actually are all my favorites in different <laughs> yeah, ways. Yeah. But the fact that oh, the Dan came on and sponsored an entire season, but the work that you've been doing is very special. Kayla. He's very special. Yeah. Well, yeah, so it was a marvelous experience, you know, being around the Phoenix for these years has been wonderful. I have to say that um, 
working with my events committee and putting together particularly the the um, the inaugural event when we first opened the theater a couple of years ago that was just uh, amazing and it was something that wasn't really planned it was like we're going to launch the theater when the season opened in september and there i was sitting in a meeting saying yeah but don't you think when people come the first time in may they're probably going to think that that's the grand opening not in september maybe we should all help with an event next thing you know i get an i see it in email and board minutes and mary beth is going to help us she's going to chair an event in may didn't know it would be so much fun, didn't know it would be so successful. And with that events committee, I guess we've done three events. We're at about $200,000 uh, raised over those three events. So I don't know when we'll be able to have our next, we used to call them the galas, now we call them the Phoenix Affair. Uh, but I don't know when we'll be able to have the next one, but whenever it is, it'll be a blowout, I can promise you that. That's awesome. No, and actually, I, I, I've worked for a number of arts organizations, and the net for these galas is really extraordinary. Um, so thank you very much for making those happen. Oh, so, well, so many generous people and and lots of fun. You know, not a stuff. We've never had a stuffy event. It's always been a lot of fun. Yeah. So uh, are we going to be able to get you to sing a little something for us this evening? You know, I, I will sing a little a little piece of, uh, of a song from the Christians. The Christians was a really extraordinary, um, an extraordinary play last spring that was about uh, what happens in a congregation, in a church, in a congregation, when there's a divide, when there's a change in, um, in philosophy or a, a schism, actually, in the church. And it was really interesting as a person who's been a church musician since... I was five years old. It was really fascinating. Uh, I'm certainly no equity actor, shouldn't really be on the stage, but to sing a little, that I felt confident doing, and uh, and Pam uh, Blevins Hinkle certainly brought out the best in all of us. So I'll sing a little bit of one of the songs that was in the show. Now I have to move uh, down stage right, I think. Okay, you're going to go to Keterman next. She's playing. I'm going to go ahead now. Are everybody ready? When the peace like a river attendeth my way, when a song Whatever my lot, you have taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul, it is well. everything you do for all of us. Bye, Bill. <laughs> See ya. Best of luck. To the theater uh, for different productions and different events. So we thank uh, Judy and Greg very much for what they have done to help bring the Phoenix this far along. 
Hello everyone, uh, this is Greg Keterman. I'm on the board of directors at the uh, Phoenix Theater. I'm delighted that you're able to join us today for our give -a -thon. I hope you really enjoy the, uh, the, the talent that you see this evening. Uh, it's great uh, kind of getting a little bit of an escape to be quite honest from uh, the daily grind of being indoors to see some of this outstanding talent. It's certainly one of the things that I miss most about the theater along with just seeing all of you, seeing people enjoying themselves uh, and getting out and about. Uh, we'll be back as soon as we are able to safely. Uh, we look forward to seeing all of you then. And in the meantime, if you're able to uh, help us out uh, this evening, we really, really appreciate it. It will keep uh, art alive and well in Indianapolis uh, in the future. And it's gonna help a lot of people as uh, we move through the operations in the coming months ahead. So uh, I hope everybody out there is safe, that you're well. Uh, we love seeing you at the theater. We look forward to seeing you again. And I hope you have a really nice evening watching this, uh, this outstanding talent. All right, I'm being told that I haven't been speaking loudly enough, so I'm gonna to try to fill the room with my voice. Uh, coming up in the next hour, we have an artist challenge with Claire Wilcher. We're going to hear from Emily Christine Holloway, Diane Conrad, Ariane Villarreal, Delia Nick Robertson, Justin Sears Watson of Phoenix Rising Dance Company, and more fabulous sponsors and vendors. So you may know her from her wonderful performance in Avenue Q, or perhaps you saw her in the first run of Ben Asakri's White City Murder. Maybe you attended comedy sports to see her play any number of performances around town. Wherever she is, she makes us laugh every time. Joining us live from Michigan is my dear friend, Claire Wilcher. I'm gonna put on the magic headphones and theoretically, Claire will be here. Claire? Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you, my friend. My God, it's a miracle. It's a technological miracle. Can Bill, you still hear me? Like you're landing a plane. Oh, well, I feel like I'm landing a plane. If I Can you actually hear me? This is the best. Yeah, yeah, but I can hear you like a lip dub, like maybe you're in a kung fu movie, and then the rest of the world <laughs> afterwards. And I love everything about this because I love everybody on the side going, I can't hear you. And everyone's like, on mute, bitch. Saying, start over. Listen, people. There's a virus killing people. We're doing our best, okay? We're doing our best. <sighs> it, it really does feel like the early days of television, even though I'm not that old and I wasn't there. I have this feeling of like TV cameras banging into each other and what happened. So um, yeah. I have been given the cue to move on. So explain artist challenge. So. If people give $250, $500, or total donations of $1,000, we're going to hear at different points Claire singing a song. So just as a reminder to the donors, you can give online, you can text, you can phone, you can mail those gifts in. Um, Ray and Cheryl Walden. Yep. So our matching donor this hour uh, is this lovely couple, Ray and Cheryl Walman. I hope you're out there watching, Cheryl and Ray. We love you. They're going to match donations in this hour up to $1,000. We think you're fabulous. I particularly love the Walmans because they are so passionate about the development of new work. Uh, they are helping to make plays like Alabaster and probably plays like Lovebird and The Pill and all the work that we're most passionate about, new plays being created here at the Phoenix Theater. Ray and Cheryl uh, help, have helped to make that possible. So, um, are we moving on to Triton? Can we move on to the Triton segment? Segment 39. Th segment 39, I am told. So bear with me again, it's like live television. Uh, so I am gonna talk a little bit about the history of the Phoenix Theater. I think we may be having some video problems again. So the Phoenix Theater was founded in 1983 and it began in the Ambassador Building, which is still in existence. It's the building, uh, apartment building directly north of the Indianapolis Marion County Public Library, the Central Library right downtown. That apartment building behind it on the north side is the Ambassador Building. Uh, and about, uh, about five years after that, uh, J. Scott Keller, through his generosity, made that beautiful little church at the corner of Park and St. Clair possible. 
And that is where Brian Fonseca, artist, producing artistic director, worked for 30 years, creating some beautiful work. Uh, I became a professional actor in that building in 1998. Uh, I made my directing debut in that building. And when I began teaching the Sanford Meisner acting technique, which my friend Martha Jacobs taught to me when my wife and I lived in Bloomington, uh, I started teaching out of that building. Uh, I taught one full two-year Meisner class there. We finished the first year of a second class, and that class made the journey to this beautiful new home uh, that we opened in April of 2018. So we just passed our two-year anniversary in this building. Uh, and believe it or not, I believe either tonight or tomorrow is the second anniversary of The Pill, which was the inaugural production on the Frank and Katrina Basile stage, which we'll be seeing later. Uh, I got to direct, that was my first directing project here in this building. So I have been told we are moving to segment 40, uh, which is, again, stories from some of our volunteers, staff, designers, and actors who are going to tell you why they call the Phoenix Theater home. So I just wanted to share how I was introduced to the Phoenix Theater. Um, so I was introduced to the Phoenix about 11 years ago. Um, I was a student at IUPUI and I was taking an intro to acting class that at the time was being uh, taught by Brian over at the theater. So I remember in the class, uh, the pieces we were using were a lot different than the theater I had been introduced to so far. I mean, I was still pretty new to theater and, and mostly seen you know, your classics and Shakespeare and, and most of the stuff that you read or introduced to um, through school. And the pieces that we were doing in class were just a lot more modern and hard hitting and they were about subject matter that was affecting the world today. So I was really taken with that idea and throughout the class the pieces just really spoke to me on a whole new level. Um, so when I finished the class I asked if there was anything I could do to stay involved with the theater and he said, well actually I'm, I'm kind of working on a show right now. I think you'd be perfect for a stage crew. So if you don't know, I do have a twin brother and he was taking the class with me. Um, and the show that we're doing was called The Do's and Don'ts of Time Travel by Nicholas Wardigo. Um, and the show was about this woman who finds the ability to do time travel. Um, and being that I had a twin brother and the show was dealing with going back in time and meeting yourself, he thought it would be really fun to kind of play with that idea. So at the start of the show, um, I would get up out of the audience and we had this big revolving set and I would turn the set, and as I would disappear behind the set, uh, my brother would appear on the other side of the stage, uh, and he would revolve the rest of the set. So we sort of played throughout the show with that, and that, like with time travel, as if we were time traveling across the stage and doing different things. Um, so it was a lot of fun. And I remember the first day that we came in to uh, work on our blocking for the show, they weren't really quite ready for us yet. You know, the actors were still working on some scenes and uh, before they could really start moving in the space. So he was like, well, actually, uh, if you guys want, you're here. Um, we do have a show that's about to start upstairs. You could just go upstairs, um, you know, watch the show, enjoy the show, and then afterwards just come back. Um, we can see if we can start working on some of that blocking. And we were like, you know, that's perfect, uh, free show. And at this time, I hadn't seen anything from the theater yet. Um, so I had no idea what I was walking into, and it was just uh, kind of walking into the show blind. Um, and the show was called Octopus. And the show completely changed anything I thought theater was or even thought it could be. I mean, I think the issue I always had um, in school with Shakespeare is I just, I could never connect to the material. It was so wrapped up in poetry and you had to really study it. Um, but this show was just so real and intimate. And the show was suddenly people talking like you and I would speak and it was dealing with today's issues. And I'd never seen it really explored on stage before. Um, it was so visceral and immediately understandable. I had never watched TV or gone to the movies and, and seen someone tackle difficult issues in this way. I sat down in the theater and it was like I was sitting in their home. And it showed me that that was the power of theater, that it can really change the way you think or feel. And it was the first time that I understood how important theater was. And the first time I, I understood why the Phoenix was so important to Indianapolis. Um, so that was my introduction to the Phoenix.
We love ushering for the Phoenix Theater, getting to see new plays produced at the highest quality, seeing our friends and productions, and bringing the magic of live theater into our family. My wife, my son, and I uh, tend to usher for every show that we can. And over the years, I have brought several of my friends to come usher with me when my family isn't available. We absolutely love the Phoenix Theater. Getting a chance to work on a play like How to Use a Knife back in 2017 in the old building basement, I really look at that as a turning point in my own acting career and in terms of things I wanted to work on. I, I really wanted to work on new play development and, and working on scripts that meant something to a community um, that didn't feel so far away from our own. And I'm incredibly grateful for Phoenix giving us the opportunity to tell these stories that wouldn't necessarily be told anywhere else. Peace be with you and greetings. I am Madam Centina, and I am here to share my concoction of the Veritas of the Phoenix, in opposed to the Vino Veritas of Peru. First, in order to seek the truth and make the truth ver serum of the Veritas, you must travel and gather these ingredients. First, you must go to the Danish island of Caraca and seek the blue Caraca. Next, you must travel down to Cuba and seek the rum Barcari of Cuba. Then you must look for the fruit juice of the pineapple. And lastly, you must make sure in the Americas that you find the club soda. And last but not least, you must have the sacred vessel of the Phoenix. We shall now prepare the Veritas, the serum of truth. First, you shall take the blue caraco of the Danish and you will pour a one count. Next, you will take the rum of Cuba, Barcardi, and you will pour a three count. Then you will take the fruit juice of the pineapple and you will pour half. Then you will take the club soda of the Americas and top it off. You will take the sacred lid of the Phoenix and seal the truth of the Veritas. <laughs> Actually, you can get all these ingredients at Kroger. I was just kidding. But it makes good for the Veritas. There, we have finished making the Veritas, the serum of truth. But I have a warning for you. Make sure that you stand your distance from others. Always be sure to wash your hands with the sacred soap. And last but not least, be safe and peace be with you. And most of all, warning, beware of the Veritas, for it will make you tell the truth. Uh, so welcome back. Uh, actually, you've always been here. I'm coming back. Uh, so. It's time for the giveaway drawing. This hour will be from Titan Brewing Company. Uh, we'll be giving this handcrafted Triton Brewing Company barrel head. Uh, again, anyone who donates $150 in this hour, your name will be put into a drawing. Again, you can give online, you can text, you can phone, you can mail in uh, a gift. Um, Again, anyone who donates at $150 or more in this hour will have a name put into a drawing. Uh, 
for this handcrafted Triton Brewing Company. So let's hear from the brewmasters themselves over at Triton. No, we don't have the Triton. Oh, that's right. I was told we don't have that video uh, available. So we are going to move on to me introducing Emily Ristine Holloway. She's a longtime Phoenix Theater artist. She's an actor, she's a director, she's a choreographer, she's the artistic director of Summer Suck Stage and Eclipse, uh, which is a collective member here at the Phoenix Theater. Reprising her role as Diana Goodman in Next to Normal, please welcome Emily Ristine Holloway. I think I met you uh, when I was doing PR for Indianapolis Civic Theater when I was at the Art Museum and you were doing a junior civic theater production and we did a photo shoot in the Japanese garden there next to the Lily Mansion. Um, we've come a long way. Anyway, lovely and thank you so much for being a part of this event. Now I am uh, delighted to reconnect with Claire Wilcher. Claire, are you there? 
Um, I am here. Are you here? I'm here. Am I on a delay again? Oh, yes. It's delightful. <laughs> Maybe it's because you're in Lansing. why but i have my indianapolis t-shirt on because i miss it and i'm representing tonight that is wonderful you know it's so great to hear your voice and uh for those of you who don't know claire is up in lansing getting her uh, mfa in acting um you want to talk a little bit about what you've been up to up there besides getting your mfa in acting well um you know grad school in quarantine is a very interesting situation, as you may have guessed. Um, but I am currently about to begin my third year at, at Michigan State University. Um, and the really great thing about the, the program here is it's half acting and half teaching. So they really um, they really prepare us to go into the world of academia and teach acting in college. So hopefully that's what I will be doing soon. I don't know. We'll see. What is anything, Bill? Nothing matters. Nothing matters. No, but I can only imagine how wonderful you are in the classroom. So uh, kudos to you for pursuing teaching because I'm beginning to realize it's one of the most, one of the noblest professions on the planet. Well, I have some great news. We hey. have zipped right by that first goal. So oh, uh, we get to hear from you. We okay. get to hear you sing. Great. I can do that. Um, okay. So. Is there anything I need to incorporate at this point or can I do that later or can I just sing or what's happening right now? I would just say, take it away. Just Perfect. sing. <laughs> All right. um, so let me get my, I'm, I'm very unprofessional and I don't have anything um, memorized and I don't have a lovely piano backup uh, or some good. Um, and Emily, you were wonderful. Uh, but I'm going to sing um, a song from Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson, which is a song that I did, uh, a show that I did, um, well, when they did it at the Phoenix, gosh, however long ago that was. Um, so this is actually one of my favorite songs from the show. Um, it's kind of the, sh the song that doesn't really fit with the show. It's the, it's the second to last song, the penultimate song if you will. Um, and it's kind of this lovely little hippie tune um, called Second Nature. And it's it's a very peaceful song, but it says a lot about um, kind of the kind of culture we live in today as far as, gosh, just trying to keep up with everybody and um, I don't know, sort of, sort of come to grips with our own greed and our own um, more, more, more kind of attitude. So forgive me, um, I'm gonna play this off of my phone and uh, I'm gonna auto scroll. Um, so I didn't play this role in the show, I played the storyteller in the hover round. Y'all were calling it a wheelchair earlier. It was a hover round or a rascal, I don't know. Um, but uh, this is a, a much different uh, song than one that the storyteller would have sung. <laughs> Let me just try to slow this down. This is what you call a smooth segues and chatting while I get things ready. It's like you don't even know I'm poking at my phone. Um, all right, let's see if I can slow this down. Okay, great. Uh, here we go. <clears throat> the grass grows a prairie a wilderness across a continent and we take it we clear it out and make it in our image oh it's not scrolling fast enough hang with me peeps hang with me i don't know how to do anything nothing matters the backyards the driveways the covered wagons rushing through the high plains the motels on the canyon they make a second nature Woo! and what was it for oh are you kidding me improvisation and what was it for this country the farms and the blood across the prairie the nation we become as we build a second nature no, no, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. The 
rivers run and parking lots, the endless, endless fields and cities. And I don't know, we make them and replace them with all our dreams of the future. Don't give your money back. I got this. Oh no, I don't got it. Wildly unprepared. And what was it for? The swimming pools, the highways, the ball games in the dust on the battlefield, the times we were so foolish and so young. No, no, no. 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 No, no. The grass grows, we take it, we want it. It's second nature to us. Apologies. <laughs> you know, Claire, it was a delight. I, I know I'm not a musical person. I mean, I, I, I like I love music, but I like your voice. The word that comes to mind is authentic. I just love how authentic your singing voice and speaking voice is. Oh. You so much it's even more authentic when you mess up seven times during the song it doesn't matter nothing matters no <laughs> it's just it's this it's this the universe is just telling everybody people you just gotta roll with it for a while you can't That's control it yeah and the best part is when we come back to your face and you have this wonderful look of like i hope everyone's still there <laughs> <laughs> I wake up most mornings that way. Is everybody still here? Uh, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Claire. Uh, I will be hearing more from you this uh, evening, I've no doubt. Uh, let's check back in with our event sponsor, Dr. Daniel H. Spitzberg, MD. So uh, one of the favorite things uh, of my job is getting to ask patrons and board members what their favorite shows are at the Phoenix or their favorite experience at the Phoenix. And so I'd be interested in hearing uh, if you have a favorite production or particular moment uh, at the Phoenix Theater Cultural Center. Well, I think uh, my history with the Phoenix uh, goes back to roughly in the 1980s when it was in the church, uh, which I, as I recall, is on Park Avenue, and um, saw some plays uh, there. They were extremely provocative type plays. Uh, and then uh, over the years, um, and I believe, I believe the building opened in May of 2018, as I recall, I had heard that there was a new building and a new venue, and uh, I was asked, I was curious about it, but then I was asked to attend a play uh, and uh, was, first of all, wanted to see the building, which I did. And the first thing that struck me, which I think would be good for all patrons coming, is parking. The parking was very easy. It was across the street. It was easily available. And it was a very short walk into the building. And... Um, going into the building i was very very taken by the design of the building uh i think it's twenty thousand square feet as i remember mm -hmm. reading yep. and uh the various not only the theaters uh, the large theater the smaller theater but the other areas in the building uh that uh support uh the play or education uh the play that i saw was uh, Apples in Winter. And uh, I ha did not have any idea what this was gonna be like. And I just came away that uh, it was a one person, one woman show. Um, she bakes an apple pie uh, during it. And uh, it's a very interesting issue of having a son on death row 
and he's requesting for his final meal that his mother come and make an apple pie. Uh, I just found that it was very well produced, that it was uh, an intriguing subject and something that you thought about uh, after the play was over. That's a wonderful testimonial, Dan. Uh, I, I was I love that play. Uh, Jan Lucas Grimm uh, is a longtime friend of mine, and she played the woman, and it was just so wonderful uh, to spend, I think it was 60 to 70 minutes real time with her actually baking that pie from beginning to end. And you will be happy to know that Jan Lucas, while we, were, we are doing this, is baking a pie during <laughs> the telethon that will be done by the end of it. So um, I, that's a little bonus for you, Dan. Perfect. Uh, We are John Lang and David Waldman, co-founders of Triton Brewing Company on Fort Bend. Our flagship beer, Rail Splitter IPA, has been a staple in Indiana beer markets since we opened in 2011. Triton Brewing Company is named after the Greek and Roman benevolent sea god Triton, messenger of the sea, calmer of the sea, bringer of good water. Beer is on average 96% water, and we believe that better water equals better beer. Our water is 100% Lawrence Utility water, charcoal filtered and softened, and then reverse osmosis purified. We temper the water, making it uniquely Triton brewing water and particular to our beers. In normal times, we operate a brew pub, beer garden, and bisto on Indy's east side, of just blocks from Fort Benjamin Harrison State Park. Seven weeks ago, when the state mandated that our business was to go exclusively to carry out, we added a bodega, online ordering, and drive through to our organization to help our neighbors address the food desert that is Indianapolis's east side. Toilet paper, bleach, ground beef, smoked meats, fresh produce, eggs, and additional sundries are available through Triton Bodega. Hot meals and cold beer are also available. You can order online at tritonbrewing.com or by calling us at 317-735-2706, then carry out or drive through. In addition to the brewery, our Beer is available in bottles and cans in Marion County and the surrounding counties at your fine liquor stores and grocery. We're very excited to be supporting the Phoenix Giveathon and giving away this handcrafted Triton Brewing Barrel Head made by our very own Brewer John Lang. Crafted from a barrel that was formerly a bourbon barrel used in our barrel aging program here at Triton Brewing Company. We participated with Phoenix Theater through the Brew Ha Ha since we opened and we're very excited to be part of this effort as well. Thank you to the Phoenix Theater, their staff and crew for allowing us to participate in the Giveathon. Cheers, stay safe, and Triton strong. Uh, just to let you all know, we are broadcasting live right now from the Crystal DeHaan Grand Lobby. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Crystal for helping to make this facility possible. A lot of donors are probably watching now who helped to make this facility possible, including Bill Farkas, one of our former board chairs and who is still currently on the board, made a lovely gift in memory of his parents, Gene and Ruth Farkas, to make our beautiful green room possible. Uh, later on in the program, we're going to go on to the Frank and Katrina Basile stage. Frank, another one of our former board chairs, uh, he and his wife Katrina helped to make that beautiful jewel box uh, of a studio theater possible. And of course, Livia and the late Steve Russell, uh, through their generosity, helped to make the Russell Theater possible. So thank you all very much for your gifts. Uh, and what is so um, heartwarming to the staff here at the Phoenix is a lot of you are continuing to make gifts during this very difficult time for everybody. Uh, we are doing our utmost to make sure that we, as I've mentioned before, weather this storm and come out the other side so that we're able to produce even more contemporary, vital American theater for our community. Uh, so thank you all very much for helping to make this possible. Um, I'm hoping that my friend Diane Conrad will be joining us soon. Uh, while we are waiting for Diane to join us from Portland, Oregon, I will, um, share with you some of my favorite theater experiences with Diane. They've been here at the Phoenix Theater. Uh, they've been in Bloomington. Uh, she and I were very fortunate to share the stage 
and Edward Albies, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf at the John Walter Performing Arts Center in Bloomington, directed by our longtime friend Patricia McKee. Uh, that was a joy. Uh, she and I used to produce together, including Naomi Wallace's One Flea Spare in Bloomington. And now I'm told that Diane is here with me live. Hello, Diane. Hello, Bill. Uh, Hello, Bill. Can you hear? I can hear you. Oh, I can hear you too. It's a miracle. I know. <laughs> I know. So, what uh, you talk about Bill. Uh, well, I want to talk about uh, the children that you uh, were in with Chuck Goat here last spring. It's such a beautiful play. I was reading through it the other day uh, with some people who had never encountered it before, and everybody was like, "I could, I could see around the room." In the beginning, they were like, "Man, man, man," and then just a little while into it, everybody was on the edge of their seats. It was, it was beautiful to hear it again. I got to be Robin. I got to be. I got to be Rose, I got to be Hazel. So it was cool. You got to play all three parts in a reading? Yeah, little bits, little bits, because people were just reading, you know. Oh. I wanted to read all the parts. <laughs> sure you did, sure you did. Oh, it was such a joy. Uh, oh, and uh, to, uh, obviously you and I have worked together uh, in many, many productions, um, but uh, to get to see you and Chuck together again, I was so moved by your work in Son uh, Vanya and Sonia and Masha and Spike. Uh, to, but to see you guys get to delve into that Lucy Kirkwood script was just a joy. Yes, it was fabulous. Even Austin Pendleton liked it. He did. He came. I didn't even know he was coming. Uh, the uh, wonderful Austin Pendleton came to the Wednesday night of dress rehearsal and led the standing ovation. And it was a nice big crowd for that. Um, yeah. So um, tell me a little bit about your history with the Phoenix Theater. I, I know a lot of it, but uh, I'm sure a lot of those people who are on Facebook don't know it. So well, tell us a little bit. Um, my first show at the Phoenix was in uh, the 1989-90 season. We did uh, the Marriage of Bet and Boo. And then I got to drive up from Bloomington a lot and do shows at the Phoenix and pretty, you know, the Phoenix and Brian saved my life. Um, I moved to Indiana and I didn't know anybody. And uh, Marcia Sabolska made me go to a show who used to be the playwright in residence at the Phoenix, made me go to a show and said, you have to see B at this theater. And I, uh, I, started auditioning and so i did funny shows did a lot of durang i assume that people don't know that the phoenix uh has done more there's there's austin pendleton with you bill there's a picture up that lucky people uh that the phoenix has done more christopher durang uh comedies than any um theater in the country uh, so I got to be funny and dark doing Christopher Durang, but also got to do some really beautiful dramatic work at the Phoenix and got to be married to you, which is great. In August, Osage County, talk about dark um, and uh, work with fabulous actors. Got to do Lynn Nottage's Sweat um, when it was hot off the presses. And that was what was wonderful and continues to be wonderful about the Phoenix is that new plays uh, erupt at the Phoenix before other people get their hands on them, which I think is um, a great asset to the community and why people should just be throwing money uh, at you right now um, during this, whatever you're calling it. What are you Give a thumb. Give a thumb. Give a thumb. I yeah. think <laughs> just give a thumb thousand dollars. I'm going to give a hundred dollars. So, and I'm just That's an actor. Awesome. So other people should give even more. Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, so I think you've kind of already touched on this, but some of your favorite productions at the Phoenix Theater that you were in, or you saw, well, I guess. Well, no, all the ones that I was in were my favorites. <laughs> um, I was thinking about the audacity of the Phoenix doing um, the three-person play Frozen with oh. me, Martha Jacobs, and our um, beautiful friend who has left us, LeBron Benton. Uh, it was, in case people don't remember, a lovely tale, uh, I'm being sarcastic, uh, about a child murderer. And a lot of people were afraid to come, and boy, the people that did come saw an exquisite rendering 
of a scientist, a grieving mother, and a killer. Um, so, you know, the Phoenix is not afraid to back away from those kind of shows while also doing crazy stuff that makes people laugh their guts out. So, you know, it's not about doing, I can't even say the plays that I've seen some theaters do over and over again. And I'm like, why, why are you doing it? Uh, when there's new work uh, to be enjoyed and experienced. And that's what the Phoenix has, has done. My favorite show, gosh, gosh, I sure did like waltzing with you and Mrs. Bob Cratchit's Wild Christmas Binge. And I uh, hit one of those columns in that Phoenix basement in the basement. Yeah. We were doing a show and you and I were dancing and I turned and bam, right in that pole. And the, the stars, I never seen stars. And I saw stars and then you just yeah. looked at me like, we got more dancing, Bill. <laughs> Let's keep going. Neither one of us are extraordinary dancers. Um, you know, but also August Osage County was a uh, particular favorite of mine. So many. God, God bless Chelsea Stauffer. That was her first production as a stage manager. And she had to wrangle you and Martha Jacobs and me and Chuck Goad and um, Matthew Rowland. Rowland and Diane Timmerman and Rich Rand. Uh, it was just, it was literally, it felt like a cast of thousands in that tiny little unisex dressing room on the yes, upper stage. And I had to crawl to get to curtain call. <laughs> yes, you did. And for years, I had a picture on my iPhone uh, of you crawling from the door, the, the door off stage crawling underneath the bay window of the set to get into places for curtain call. And uh, I yes. used to tell I, I used to tell people, this is the glamour of show business right here. It is not an attractive shot, Bill, and I'm very glad we don't have it to share today at the give a -thon. But I am willing to, to crawl for curtain calls, that's true. Yep, you did. Boy, that show, man, we earned it. And uh, Chuck Go did all the food for that. Uh, he would cook at home and bring all that food in. So not only was he a beautiful Uncle Charles, Uncle Charlie, but he cooked all of that food. So real quickly, what are you doing during quarantine? Um, trying not to lose my mind. Um, <laughs> I'm doing uh, yoga that our teacher, our acting teacher, Martha Jacobs, was my also my Iyengar yoga teacher for years. And uh, I talked to her on the phone and she said, perhaps you should be doing some yoga. And so I always try to listen to Martha. So I'm doing that. And, uh, you know, I have no fingernail polish on because I'm washing things so much and cleaning things. I'm not one of those people who have been inspired to new artistic heights during the quarantine. I'm just a pouty and uh, trying to pretend that things are going to be okay someday. Well, I love you so much, my friend, and thank you for the gift. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you for reminding me of all the beautiful theater experiences we have shared in our 23 years of uh, knowing one another, starting with Marcia Sobolska's Dear John. God bless Martha Jacobs for trying to direct me with absolutely no training uh, to try to hold never. my... She was shocked. She was shocked, but you're better now. I was. I've gotten a little bit better. Well, my friend, be well. And someday I will be coming out to Portland, Oregon. Of course, I was supposed to be there the first week of April, um, but it's going to happen someday. Um, so, please, uh, everybody who's listening, please give money to the Phoenix. It is a exceptional theater with high standards that reminds us what it means to be alive and be humans and interact with each other in real life. That's it. I love you. I love you. So with that, I'm gonna send it over to Kathy Patalik for an update on this wonderful give -a Hello again, everybody. We just had a fantastic hour. I'm gonna keep it in suspense for just a little bit because I got a few messages from some folks. First of all, from Ron Pop in honor of Delia Robertson, who's our general manager here. He said he has worked with many of us here at the theater and he loves us all. Scott Reef, who is a board member of ours, made a very generous $1,500 gift to the Phoenix Theater. We also had a gift from Duncan and Rebecca Gilmore. Thank you very much. Bridget Haight, we appreciate your gift as well. 
Couple other names uh, to mention. Jolene Mentick Moffat, who you saw earlier this evening, Jack Milan, Jane Patton, Lynn Reese, and Delia Robertson. Those are just a few of the folks who've been giving all hour. I'm sorry, I wish I could mention all of you, but please know it is a heartfelt thank you to all of you for supporting our mission and continuing to give to the Phoenix Theater Cultural Center at this time. So within this last hour, which there's a little bit left to go, but in this last hour, we've already raised over $5,000. So thank you, thank you, thank you. On behalf of the staff and the board of directors, we truly appreciate your support. Now back to Bill. So the good news continues. We reached our second goal so that we can hear the incomparable Claire Wilcher sing again. So Claire, what are you gonna do for us this time? I'm going to sing a song for you, Bill. What do you think I'm going to do? <laughs> I knew that. What song? So I'm going to sing, wait for it. I'm going to sing a Christmas song, okay? Um, because I got my start um, at, at the Phoenix doing the Christmas shows. And I always loved the variety that the Phoenix Christmas shows always bring. You know, you're not going to get your typical... Christmas songs, right? And so I, um, I was. I, this is one of my very favorite Christmas songs. I don't think it has been done. I checked with Chelsea, who, P.S., is a complete badass running all this stuff. I know she's working her butt off, and all of you guys are. Um, but shout out to Chelsea for coordinating everything. She's a queen. Um, but anyway. I'm going to sing um, Tim Minchin's White Wine in the Sun, which is one of my favorite Christmas songs because it's not very Christmassy at all. And if you're taking That's suggestions, fun. I think it would be a perfect fit for a very phoenix, if I may. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to sing a little Tim Minchin for you. Um, let's hope my phone cooperates. Okay, uh, here I just think it's the sweetest song. And there was kind of a trend going around for a while when all of this quarantine started and people were putting their Christmas trees up, uh, kind of pretending like maybe they wanted to <clears throat> embrace the feeling of Christmas and the of coziness and of being home to kind of, I think, self-soothe a little bit for those of us who um, are really isolated. And um, so I'm going to, I love the sentiment of this song about brighter days ahead. And I'll try not to cry while I sing it. Uh, no promises, though. Here we go. <clears throat> really like Christmas It's sentimental, I know But I just really like it I am hardly religious I'd rather break bread with Dawkins Than Desmond Tutu, to be honest And yes, I have all of the usual objections to consumerism, to the commercialization of an ancient religion, to the westernization of a dead Palestinian press ganged into selling PlayStations and beer. But I still really like it. I'm looking forward to Christmas, though I'm not expecting a visit from Jesus, I'll be seeing my dad, my brothers and sisters, my gran and my mom, they'll be drinking white wine in the sun, I'll be seeing my dad, my brothers and sisters, my gran and my mom, they'll be drinking white wine in the sun. I don't go in for ancient wisdom. I don't believe just because ideas are tenacious, it means that they're worthy. I get freaked out by churches. Some of the hymns that they sing have nice chords, but the lyrics are dodgy. 
And yes, I have all of the usual objections to the miseducation of children who in tax-exempt institutions are taught to externalize blame and to feel ashamed. Pardon? And to judge things as plain right or wrong. But I quite like the songs. I'm not expecting big presents. The old combination of socks, jocks, and chocolates is just fine by me. Cause I'll be seeing my dad. My brothers and sisters, my gran and my mom. They'll be drinking white wine in the sun. I'll be seeing my dad. My brothers and sisters, my gran and my mom. They'll be drinking white wine in the sun. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you, my baby girl, my jet lagged infant daughter, you'll be handed around the room like a puppy at a primary school. And you won't understand. But you will learn someday that wherever you are and whatever you face, these are the people who make you feel safe in this world, my sweet blue-eyed girl. And if my baby girl, when you're 21 or 31 and Christmas comes around, and you find yourself 9,000 miles from home, you'll know whatever comes. Your brothers and sisters and me and your mom will be waiting for you in the sun whenever you come. Your brothers and sisters, your aunts and your uncles, your grandparents, cousins, and me and your mom will be waiting for you in the sun, drinking white wine in the sun. Darling, when Christmas comes, we'll be waiting for you in the sun, drinking white wine in the sun. Waiting for you in the sun. Waiting for you. I really like Christmas. It's sentimental, I know. Merry Christmas, everybody. Just a few months early, but Merry I think we need the beans. Merry Christmas, my friend, and brava. That was lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much. So before we move on to our next artist, we have a winner of a hand-carved Triton Brewing Company Barrelhead, and that is Jane Patton. So Jane, uh, you are the winner of this beautiful hand-carved uh, piece of art. So we will be making sure we get that to you soon. Now we're going to uh, move on to another dear friend of mine, Ariane Villarreal, who's living the high life in Los Angeles. Uh, I think a lot of us at the Phoenix Theater have gotten to see her really grow into a beautiful artist. Uh, the last thing that she did here at the Phoenix Theater was our production of The Pill, um, in which she played Dr. Gregory Pincus in Tom Horan's play about the genesis of the birth control pill. 
Uh, and she's just a delight. I also uh, got a chance to direct her in my professional directing debut at the Old Phoenix Theater in Amy Herzog's 4,000 Miles, that also included my acting director, mentor, uh, Martha Jacobs. Um, so Ariane is going to be singing the Hallelujah, Hallelujah Chorus mashup from a very Phoenix Xmas 9. Please welcome Ariane Villarreal. secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord but you don't really care for music do you? Well it goes like this the fourth, the fifth the minor fall the major lift the baffled king composing safe and well there in Los Angeles we'll, with all our other theater friends. Tell them all uh, I wish them well and I send you all love out there in California. <laughs> 